herb. Herb is a plant. I mean, herbs are good for everything. Welcome to Gene Cannabis TV. You just made the trip and uh, we got some uh, interesting uh, program tonight. This is beginning as we're uh, filming this. This is the 3rd of June and it's the first day of Hemp History Week. I have a good friend of ours, Naraya here, uh, very knowledgeable in, in uh, uh, hemp issues, uh, even a, a published author even. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm lucky that way. I, yep. I, I, That's uh, great. Got a book here that came out, I uh, put together and, and it has a chapter in here that talks about hemp. Uh, and uh, basically it was uh, given an award by the, a online organization, uh, it's a U.S. book news report and uh, they declared it the social change book of 2005. And then they took a chapter from here in my book and put it in the anthology or the Dalai Lama and Deepak Chopra and a whole bunch of other famous names so that's as close as I've ever been to the Dalai Lama <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Deepak. Right. But I'm here for hemp today, and especially this is the first day of Hemp History Week, mm -hmm. 2013, and uh, this is an annual event that's been going on for four years now, and we're all nationally in every state coming up with something to educate our citizens to the hemp information and the history of it. And uh, as part of that, we're all excited that our senator, uh, Senator Wyden, here in Oregon is the federal, uh, is our state senator to uh, Congress and, and the Senate. He is the main sponsor of the Hemp Industrial Hemp Act of 2013 in the U.S. And he's trying uh, very hard, and we're really proud of him for what he's doing to try to get this passed. And one of the things that he's, he mentioned when I interviewed him was that he was surprised to find hemp hearts here in Oregon for sale in a, a Costco store uh, in Tigard. And he, he said he wasn't even clear on why our farmers can't be the ones that are actually growing the hemp seeds that we use and eat. And we are the majority of consumers of the Canadian hemp seed. Now that's just one of the areas that I'm interested in today, but. Uh, Excellent. Yes, and we have a celebration coming up this week. Uh, uh, a gentleman that goes by the moniker of Papa Hemp, we know him by Michael P. Moore, uh, is coming up with, he has a one-day event, it's on the uh, 8, June 8th, Saturday, June 8th, it goes from noon, high noon until, no, excuse me, t yeah, high noon until 10 p.m., that's it, uh, and it's at 267 Van Buren Street, that's across from the Ninkasi Brewery uh, in Whitaker, so that's going to be a great event. Uh, some of the bands that are coming, Juniper Hollow, where I played Hemp Fest last year, incredible band, good people. I Shell and Circle of Light, been around for years, uh, great music, always there when there's, uh, and same thing as Juniper Hollow, always there when there's, uh, uh, people need uh, some entertainment, you know, and, and supporting good causes, good people. Uh, Sweet Revenge and Rocktopia, so I'm not familiar with those groups, but I'm sure they're the same, same uh, genre. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's going to be a, a great event, and we appreciate Michael Moore for doing that. We've got, uh, he's got uh, sponsors here, Vote Hemp and the Hemp History Week, which is great. Uh, I contacted both of them uh, through the Hemp Fest, and they never heard, I never heard back from them. Uh, also, Hemp Industries Association is a sponsor, uh, as well as a local group, uh, company, the Mary Hempsters, which uh, they are still in business. I wasn't sure. I don't hear from them much, but uh, they haven't. But anyway, so it's a uh, great event. So that's a local thing. That's what we're doing locally. Mm -hmm. And I want to run a, read a letter to the editor real quick here, and then we'll get back into hemp, and then we have a, a, a friend of Naraya is going to come on for the second segment to tell us some more about hemp and, and everything on that. But... Uh, this is a letter to the editor published by our friend uh, Jim Gregg. Jim's been on the show many times. Uh, Jim is, uh, uh, I've forgotten, his, uh, some kind of a severe arthritis. I've forgotten the exact terminology, but he's very, very uh, bedridden. <laughs> but, and yet, he's still one of our most active activists, I guess you could say. So, in Red Cigar, on the 2nd of June, he wrote, uh, they titled it, Regulate Pot, Don't Prosecute It. <clears throat> he writes, it seems the area law enforcement hasn't yet learned the value of working with the local community. The May 23rd raid on the Greener side, a medical marijuana resource center, can hardly be considered a top priority. With law enforcement services severe, secure, severely cut across the state, surely there are more dangerous individuals threatening community safety than a group of m medical marijuana patients. Besides the raid in Eugene, it has been reported that after a two-year investigation, up to 70 law enforcement officers were used in concurrent raids in Southern Oregon. In August of last year, a woman in Josephine County called 911 as a man who had previously assaulted her was breaking into her home. The dispatcher had to tell the woman there was no officer to send. The county had laid off 23 deputies because of budget cuts. In Oregon, 2010, 
According to state police statistics, there were 1,246 reported forcible rapes, but only 243 arrests were made. How long will Oregon voters stand for our police and sheriffs knowing, kowtowing to the federal drug war bureaucracy? How long before Oregon legislatures and voters figure out the simple economics of marijuana regulation over cannabis persecution? How long before Oregon's leaders finally disavow federal, federal lunacy and act to protect patients instead of throwing them under the prohibition bus? Jim Gregg, organizer, Americans for Safe, safe Access, Greenleaf. So that's uh, from our, our friend Jim and makes up great points. And, and while I was speaking of that, I don't want to forget our uh, June 6th court support, our friend Chelsea uh, and her employee, uh, June, oh, I can't know, I forgot her name. So, uh, oh, but anyway, <coughs> June 6th at 8.30 p.m., Lane County Courthouse, 8th and Oak. We definitely need court support and need people there uh, to uh, show the support and give moral support. Uh, and then there was another article that was in the Huffington Post referencing this uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, services. He said, the, the man eventually forced entry to the house wherein he proceeded to brutally rape the women before fleeing. After the attack, police went in search of, for 24-year-old Michael uh, Bella and arrested him. The Sheriff's Department blamed the lack of resources due to recent public funding cuts. <clears throat> there isn't a day go by that we don't have another victim, said Josephine County Sheriff Gil, Gil, Gilbertson. In Joseph County, 80% of sheriff's deputies lost their jobs when the cuts were made. <clears throat> the few that remain cannot respond to emergency calls during the evening or on weekends. After the budget cuts, which occurred before the rape incident, Josephine County Gil Gerberson said in a, press, in, a news, in a press release that victims of domestic violence should, quote, consider reloc relocating to an area with adequate police services. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the county that uh, uh, had raids, uh, four raids, or I know, I forgot how many raids, but arrested four people and met at the same time as our friends here in the Greener Side. So the injustice goes on. I like to say law enforcement. Uh, the prohibition, Canada prohibition is coming to an end. Get used to it. Yeah. So anyway, let's get back to hemp and uh, hemp history week. And uh, so we've got uh, another three minutes plus. So uh, what can you tell me about hemp? Uh, well, can we, smoke right it get, the, can we smoke it and get stoned? Well, that's the thing. Right? Oh. You can't get stoned on it. And in fact, it's almost practically impossible to get any kind of uh, high whatsoever out of industrial hemp. Uh, the real deal about the drug war that is really outrageous is that industrial hemp is considered a drug, and it's not. It has very, very minimal 0.03% of THC, if that, that much, or 0.05%, and uh, that's not enough. And I mean, you could smoke a house made out of it, and it still wouldn't get you high. <laughs> but uh, the reality of, of the economy is coming forward because of what Canada has done. And one of the big things that they discovered, and they put out in a report in 2010, that they had already uh, uh, found that there was 25,000 products currently available that can be made out of, that are being made out of industrial hemp. And I, I have to mention right now, that's only 25,000 products because what industrial hemp is capable of, Dan, because what we're finding out is that the plastics and the building materials and the seed for food are three real essential money makers. And the reality uh, of the Canadian thing is that they're, they're, they're able to get 700 pounds of seeds out of an acre. And out of that 700 pounds of seed can press into 50 gallons of oil and 530 pounds of meal. And th these, this is uh, uh, rated highly above all the other products uh, and, and uh, I'm sorry, products, the uh, farming agricultural commodities. And uh, the real value of the products in America as of 2011, there was over $452 million worth of hemp products purchased in this country where we're not allowed yet to grow the industrial hemp. Yeah, we can buy the products made out of it here. And, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, hemp. It makes sense, doesn't you know, it? <laughs> I'm really excited about hemp hearts. We yeah. had hemp hearts at our hemp fest one year. A lady mm -hmm. came out and brought out hemp hearts. Hip hearts. Hemp hearts. And what it is, the hemp heart is where you take the seed, take the shell, the uh, uh, seed, the shell, uh, remove the shell, and, and, and then you have just the inside part. And uh, it's incredible. It's super healthy. I, I, in our eye, I can tell you more about it. But uh, it tastes great, too. And that's what's incredible. It's good and good for you. Not only that, Dank, it's, it's, it's like highest protein there is in the vegetable kingdom that you can actually mm. metabolize. Mm. And it beats out soybeans. And we all know how much GMO and poisons go into the soybeans. And as far as cotton goes, too. So we're looking at industrial hemp as an economy, as well as jobs, jobs for everyone in their community where hemp is grown. So we're looking forward to that being here. Right, so you bet. So the second segment, uh, Mariah is going to be coming on and talk to Donnie. And uh, so we're going to be right back. We've been almost exerted ourselves, so we've got to take a break and rest up. But uh, we'll be right back. 
Kemp hasn't always been considered the bad boy of the herb family. For example, 200 years ago, we might have seen Ben Franklin pulling into Martha's Vineyard, hoping to find George Washington at home. The first stop in his tireless quest for more paper fiber, Kemp played a major role in the achievement of colonial independence and was a part of everyday life. George, still stiff as a fresh start shirt, I see. And you, Ben, <laughs> healthy and still plump from all your fine indulgences, I see. George, only you could be eloquent enough to call me a glutton and still make it sound like a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and in how many ways has the good Lord been active in your life these days? I would call it an act of God if I could get enough paper to run my new almanac. But uh, I would consider it a small miracle if Pumba could fix this. Oh, surely. Uh, have you talked to Thomas Jefferson? I hear his new strain oh, of Indian hemp has made him the biggest dealer in the colony. I've heard some good things about the flower of the Indian hemp. Here's one that I grew from Tom's strain. Sticky. 5,000 years of cultivation for hashish. I understand it works best if it's rendered seedless. Oh, yes, I know. I was late in pulling my mails this season. Shame, George. Not pulling your mails does not make good sense. All right, we're back. And there's my partner, Donnie, here. We are in eugeneindustrialhemp.com. And our mission is to make Eugene and, and the whole Willamette Valley the hemp capital of the world, the industrial hemp capital of the world. The reason is, you can't really be successful in the hemp business unless you're growing the hemp close to where you're manufacturing products out of it. The main cost, in other words, is in transporting the raw material, which is easier if you're in the local area it is grown in. So that's one reason that we're excited about it, because we know we can grow it here in Oregon, on both sides of the mountain. And it's one of those things that we need as an economy and for the jobs. We lost the forest, the, the lumbers, the, the, the business that we used to exist on, and now we need something to replace it. Our citizens are the poorest in the nation, and that's one of the reasons that we want to do it, because we know how to work, and we know how to work hemp. So that's one reason that we're really focusing on that, Donnie. You got anything else you want to add to that? Well, I, you know, first of all, I'd like to discuss just the fact that, you know, being on the show, it's a great opportunity, and we, we'd like to see the hemp groups work together now and, and try to make, really, we want to make Eugene the industrial hemp capital. But we understand that as far as the cannabis issue and all the, the prison and all the, all the things that we've had to go to get to this point. Now, we need to join hands and work together because we, we can make Eugene the industrial hemp capital, and we can work together to do this. All we need to do is begin to motivate and we get the education our group. Now, this isn't going to go away. This is going to change. Washington, Colorado, and Kentucky are moving forward quickly now on this. Now, if we want to make Eugene the industrial hemp capital, we need to start focusing on what we can do now. Okay, uh, one example is we got over uh, one billion of our population is suffering from malnutrition, protein. What do we got? The best protein on the planet, but we can't grow it? Now, that is a big problem, and we've got to deal with this, and the reason that we've allowed this just to go on for so long, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little disgraced at my age for not being more participant until now, but I'm really sorry, but now I'm changing, I'm going to do what I can. Now, I just want to mention again that a lot of that is dealing with the economy. I mean, if you factor in uh, hemp and its uh, harvesting time as a total value of $860 per acre, and compared to other crops, uh, where, you know, cotton, that's like $347 an acre. Uh, <laughs> Douglas fir, $50 an acre. Uh, you, you just can't, you can't match what hemp can do. It's such a prolific plant. And with its mass, it's able to make anything and everything from building materials on, on up to uh, deck sealants and uh, perfumes. So what we're looking at now here is uh, the large volume that it takes to, to make the hemp products and the large volume it, it takes to be able to harvest the hemp seed, uh, we need to help our farmers. We need to make this hemp friendly here in Oregon. And we want to encourage all our law enforcement and our uh, legal politicians in the state to follow our Senator Wyden's lead and embrace industrial hemp as a real economy and job maker that we need. Now, one of the issues is always, you know, people mention is like, oh, well, hemp, industrial hemp is legal in parts of the world. Now, and then why, if it's legal, why hasn't it, 
you know, come to fruit as being you know, the, the, the product there or the plant that we say that it is. And one of the issues is that it's because the U.S. is the biggest buyer of these products and also because of this dilemma that we've always placed on, uh, on the plant. So it's the whole drug issue, which Anslinger, from, this is a whole, you'll learn about this during History Week, but the reason why we have this, the reason why people have been arrested for smoking is because of the industrial use of the plant, the control of the plant, and that's been the issue and this has been the fight. Now, if you talk about the Australia, they were having the problems what they've had with there that they mentioned was that one of the reasons they've had this difficulty is because there has not been a relationship between the, the farmers and the industry. So the idea is you've got to make this relationship. We've got to even discuss that when the farmers come forward and begin to grow this, this product, that they have, we have a vehicle in order to, and a market to, to, to make out of it. So I think we're ready to go. Yeah, this, it's, it's, like, uh, it's a no-brainer when you're looking at the protein of the seeds here. Uh, it's, like Donnie mentioned, so there's no reason for people to be starving in our country and especially to be protein deficient because hemp seed is the easiest thing to grow out of hemp. And it's one of the things that is, uh, by, by weight, it's 35% oil in those little seeds. And it, it contains 80% polyunsaturated fats. And it's exceptionally rich source of the two essential fatty acids, linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acids. And it's definitely the, the biggest producer of gamma linoleic acids in the world. The oil that's made from the seeds has not only all the amino acids that we need that we can't get ourselves in our body, but it also has the ability to increase your health by allowing your cannabinoid system to work in harmony with your immune system. And that's another thing we also find on the other end with the medicinal aspects of cannabis, where the oils that are used from the THC strains of cannabis are also found to be cancer killing. They actually eat cancers as fast as they can. And that's one of the things that has helped a lot of us become aware of the other benefits that cannabis has in the industrial hemp realm. It's not just medicine. And that one of the things that we're really focusing on is this week, we're going to have a festival at, across the street from the Nkasi Brewery here in the Whitaker area. And that, that's going to be on Saturday. That's the 8th I believe is June 8th, June 8th. and uh, Saturday from noon till around uh, 7 or 6, something like that, we'll be having that. And there's going to be plenty of examples of industrial hemp. There will be a lot of information. I'll be speaking there. Donnie and I are, are going to be speaking and also helping out with the nonprofit table. So please come talk to us because Eugene, industrialhemp.com, is a clearinghouse for networking and implementing all that you need for the resources to get that happening here as an industry in our area. And that's what we're doing. We're spearheading a, a, a group that can offer information and networking help to everyone. And we're looking for networkers who want to help us speak to, to politicians and stores and other manufacturing companies about that so we can all be ready here in Eugene as soon as it is going to be federal legal. legal. And we know it's going to eventually become federally legal one way or the other. If we have to call a whole state's constitutional convention, we will. But we hope you all embrace the, the Industrial Hemp Act of 2013 that's put in by our Senator Wyden and allow our American farmers to make the money on the main consumers of hemp in the world, and that's the U.S. market here in our country where we can't grow it. Now, I would like to emphasize that. Uh, that would be eugeneindustrialhemp.com is if we're not gonna get any movement with the legislature, if they're gonna continue, uh, the Fed and the state, whatever obstacles they put up, then we're going to decide on to uh, organize a, a national convention to amend the Constitution, which it, we can do it as a state to circumvent the legislation, to do it as a state vote. We have enough now on the medical side probably to, to, to go into, I think we need two-thirds majority on that mm -hmm. to actually do it. Now they've talked about it, and if nothing else, we can pressure them to act, because otherwise they're gonna lose their power and give it back. So that'd be one thing that we we're discussing heavily that we'd like to do. So, Getting together with Eugene EugeneIndustrialHemp.com, we can begin to discuss some different ways that we can approach to make Eugene the industrial hemp capital. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's real. Uh, the, the Colorado model, I can just give you an example here. Uh, that, that their research, that they studied before they passed the, uh, in the law there, uh, that it, the uh, estimated 1,100 new jobs right off the bat, and that's in the non-farming industry part of it. And it's a net impact of $107 million a year to the state economy of Colorado. But that's just an estimate, and that's just Colorado. So like, uh, you can imagine what it would be like if we had all of our states being able to come up with several million, a hundred, several hundred million 
dollars a year extra economy and the jobs that it would be putting out for our citizens. Just imagine what we could do if we didn't have all the impediments in our way that keep industrial hemp illegal as a drug when it has no drug value whatsoever. Yeah, you're, we're talking jobs, jobs, jobs. You want to, you know, worried about this trillions in deficit money. Let us plant the hemp and let us pay down the debt. We can do it as a nation. We can have this taken care of in a few years if you just allow us to do it. Yeah, there's uh, one estimate uh, that the hemp industry in, uh, put in saying just for energy alone, uh, hemp could produce $700 billion in imports for our country. That's a trillion dollar industry that we're looking at now industrial hemp. And the beauty about this industry is that you can, it, you can access this industry at any point. I mean, it's over 10,000 years old. I mean, heck, people can grow it out anywhere and find su su sustainable use at it. But if you look to the future, the composite industries that we're headed for, it's amazing. You can imagine where someday that you go into a center like Eugene, anything that you would want could be produced and manufactured as a composite, as an industry. It can be made right from the, the, the work that we went out and gathered, the symbiotic relationship that we have with that plant that we can develop as a community. Anyway, um, it's ready to go and it, it's not stepping back because it's not going away. It's going to happen. So join us. Join us and sign up on our website, eugeneindustrialhemp.com. Tell me, Dan, why haven't we been seeing more of that newspaper that you've been doing? Quite frankly, Tom, there's been a lot less of that newspaper that I'm doing. With the newsprints being on ration, I just don't have an, enough paper to, to put out any volume at all. You know, I've been meaning to ask you, don't you think it would be a good idea if I had my own mill? Well, if you base that mill and the paper you made out of it on hemp, it certainly would be. I grew so much hemp this year from that hemp strain that after I used all I could, I still had enough left over to pay all uh, my that, taxes that with is, hemp. That is I'm sure news. it would grow enough for a mill. Yes. Don't you think that the uh, colonists could be persuaded to grow a little bit more than their mandatory 10%? Well, I've been writing letters to every farmer I know all over the country here to get them to grow more and more hemp on their land for the colony needs. You know, if the colonists grew more hemp, we wouldn't need Georgie Borgie. 